Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, good morning. Good to see you all here today on this beautiful day. Uh, Today we're closing out our friendship series. It's called uh, When uh, Helping Friends Through Tough Times. And our message today is When a Friend is Discouraged. Uh, Proverbs 17.22. Let's read this one out loud together off the screen here. It says, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit drains one's strength. I'd like for you to circle that word drains. Uh, I looked at a couple of different translations on this. One of them said saps your strength. And, uh, you know, that's the danger of discouragement. It, it drains the life out of us. It saps the life uh, out of us. And, you know, nobody wants to go through life with their strength drained. Uh, nobody puts uh, be discouraged at the top of their list of things to do today. And uh, that's just not how we want to live. But the harsh reality of life is, is that discouragement does come our way. And health issues can sap our spirits as well as our bodies. Uh, Marital problems can make life tiring. Difficulties with our kids wear us out. Jobs uh, weigh us down. And so there's a need for us to learn uh, how to handle discouragement. Uh, You know, what do you do when life uh, drains the strength out of you? What, What do you do when it drains the strength out of a friend? And, you know, we face different types of discouragement. We, we can suffer from relational discouragement or situational discouragement. Uh, relational discouragement is when relationships go sour. That's when conflict or betrayal or, or maybe something as wounding as divorce comes into our life. Uh, situational discouragement is when things just don't go our way. Uh, we face, uh, you know, health issues or unemployment or a financial setback. And, and so discouragement brings with us with it a sense of hopelessness. And we respond to discouragement in a variety of ways. Uh, you know, some people get moody. Uh, some people become apathetic. Uh, some people eat. You know, they get discouraged. They look for their comfort food. Uh, some people sleep. When they get discouraged, they, they retreat into sleep mode. Uh, some people shop. They get discouraged, they, uh, they go shopping, and others will isolate or withdraw or watch TV or play video games. You know, they get discouraged, they just turn into a couch potato. Some people bake. Uh, when they get discouraged, uh, they, they don't eat, they just bake stuff and give it away to other people. And if that's you, uh, see me after the service. <laughs> Now, if from time to time you struggle with discouragement, you're not alone. You're just human. Uh, We all struggle with discouragement on this side of heaven. And uh, the the problem isn't that you you check into discouragement hotel. The problem is when you start paying monthly rates. And so it's really a matter of of degree there. So if you're discouraged today or you've got a friend who's discouraged, I want to give you some good news. Uh, Discouragement is often... Uh, it stands at the door of real spiritual growth. Uh, there's just kind of a spiritual mystery there, the way, the way this works. But oftentimes, uh, you know, when we hit our low spots, when we get discouraged, uh, we are often just about to see God do something really amazing in our life. And in the Bible, we see God use people who were very discouraged in amazing ways. If you don't want to read some incredible stuff in the Old Testament, you can read the Psalms uh, of King David. David had these incredible highs and these incredible lows. And you don't have to look very far to find a discouraging psalm. I was visiting an, an older lady in the, in the hospital a few years ago and asked her if I could read some scripture to her, and, and she said yes. And I said, well, where would you like me to read? And she says, oh, uh, I love the Psalms, but just don't read a yucky one. And uh, so today I'm going to read a couple of yucky psalms to you. Uh, Psalm 38, David says, My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sin. 
I am bent over and racked with pain. My days are filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me and my health is broken. I'm exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. See any discouragement there? Yeah. Psalm 88. I've cried out to you day and night, God, hear my cry. My life is full of troubles and death draws near. You have thrust me down to the lowest pit into the darkest depths. And I just want you to know that if you are in the lowest pit, if you are in the darkest depths, if you are in deep discouragement, God can use you in incredible ways like he used other people in Scripture. And on your outline, I've listed three people that that God used in great ways, even though they face significant discouragement. And that's Moses, Elijah, and Jonah. And we're going to look specifically at at one scene in Moses' life. You know the the story. You've seen the movie. The, The Jewish people were slaves for 400 years in Egypt, and they had cried out to God for generations. God, free us, set us free, set us free. And God finally said, Moses, I want you to lead them out of Egypt and into the promised land. And that's when the ten plagues happened to convince Pharaoh to let them go. And Moses leads the Jews out of Egypt. They're being chased by Pharaoh and his army. They get to the Red Sea. The Red Sea miraculously parts. The Israelites walk across on dry ground. Uh, Pharaoh and his army come in and the water collapses on them and they're destroyed. And God promises to lead the Jews to a great land to become a great nation. And yet in the face of that promise, in the midst of that, they become disobedient and they wind up wandering around in the desert uh, for 40 years. And so there's about 2 million of them wandering around in the desert. Uh, Every day they have to have food and every day God has to provide them with food because they're in the desert. But over time, they begin complaining about it because every day, God provided them with the same food. And uh, it was good food. It was manna from heaven. You know, did you ever ever have, uh, you know, like my grandma's apple pie or uh, my uh, great aunt Eva's baked bread? We We would refer to that as, man, this is like manna from heaven. And I mean, it was just, it was just amazing. But imagine if that's all you had to eat every day. And eventually, uh, you know, your, your favorite food every single day for every meal, uh, you get tired of it. And that's what happened to the Israelites. And so they start telling Moses, we want something else. We want something else. And Moses is getting all these complaints from all these people. And, and finally, he's had it. Numbers 11, it says, Moses heard all the families standing in front of their tents weeping. And the Lord became extremely angry. I mean, the Lord's had it. People have had it. Moses has had it. God's had it. Moses was also very aggravated. And Moses said to the Lord, why are you treating me, your servant, so miserably? What did I do to deserve the burden of a people like this? Are they my children? Am I their father? Is that why you have told me to carry them in my arms like a nurse carries a baby to the land you swore to give their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep complaining and saying, give us meat. I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. I'd rather you killed me than treat me like this. Please spare me this misery. Moses is seriously discouraged. And what he's really saying here is he's saying, why me? Lord, you're the one who promised this to all these people. Why why have you put this burden on me? Why me, Lord? Any of you ever said, you know, why me, Lord? Anybody? Okay. I appreciate your hesitancy because, you know, in the Bible, when people do that, sometimes the ground just opens up and swallows them. (laughs) Okay. But, uh, but most of us, I think, at some point have said, why me, Lord? Why did I lose my job? Why is my marriage falling apart? Why are my finances so difficult? And if you look at these biblical characters of Moses, Elijah, and Jonah, Moses said, I'd rather you kill me than treat me like this. 
Elijah said, I've had enough, Lord, take my life. Jonah said, just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive. I mean, that's some serious discouragement. But out of that desperation comes hope. And if you're down and discouraged, honestly, you're at the front door of God doing something in you and through you that is absolutely amazing. There is hope on the other side of discouragement. And you need to remember that. And maybe you need to help a friend remember that too. Okay? Now, we get discouraged for all different kinds of reasons, physical reasons like exhaustion or chronic pain or low blood sugar, emotional reasons like loneliness, grief, abuse, childhood trauma, spiritual reasons. You know, guilt, guilt from unconfessed sin causes us to be discouraged. You know, sin that is not dealt with will cause discouragement. But there are a thousand circumstantial reasons for discouragement. But there there are some that are very common, some that uh, almost all of us can relate to. And I want you to be prepared for these in your own life and and in the life of a friend. And so what are the warning signs uh, that you may be uh, discouraged? Well, the first one is fatigue. Fatigue. Uh, caused, uh, when, that's when you're consumed by activity, when you're worn out by weariness. Uh, Moses says, the load is far too heavy. You know, imagine Moses' situation. I mean, Moses is the help desk for two million people. I mean, he's got, you know, I don't like where my tent's located. I don't like how my spouse is treating me. You know, I'm tired of eating manna. Can you help me find my camel? I mean, just anything, <laughs> they're just... You know, all three of these cases, Moses, Elijah, and Jonah, physical exhaustion was a factor. I mean, so I, let me just ask you, how tired are you? How worn out are you? And if you're feeling tired and fatigued, I, I love this prayer in Psalm 6. David says, I am worn out, O Lord, have pity on me. Give me strength, for I am completely exhausted. And if you battle with discouragement regularly, uh, you might want to take a look at your physical condition. You know, there's a direct correlation between physical exercise and a reduction in discouragement. Physical exercise reduces discouragement. And that can seem odd at first. I mean, if I'm physically weary, if I'm worn out, why would I want to do something else physical? But there's a big difference between working hard and working out. Um, You know, years ago I was at the gym and and there was a guy in there and uh, he had on a t-shirt that said, uh, two men in a truck. And uh, so I asked him him about it and he was a mover. And I said, so do you drive the truck? And he goes, no, he says, I'm one of the lifters. I help move stuff. And I said, so you're lifting heavy stuff all day for work. What are you doing in the gym lifting heavy stuff? And he told me, he says, there's a difference between working hard and working out. He says, working hard all day uh, uh, wears me out, it breaks me down. And he says, so I come here to the gym and I work out because it builds me up and it prepares me for the hard work that I have to do. I mean, it seems counterintuitive, but there, there really is something to that. And so if, if you're going to beat a discouragement... You want to take a look at your physical condition. You want to be, try and be physically fit. You also want to be emotionally fit. You know, that, that, those two go, go together. You know, your, in fact, your discouragement may actually be fueled by a lack of exercise. It could actually be fueled because you're not eating right. And so, yeah, you may need to cut some things out of your schedule, but you may need to add some healthy things into your schedule. You may need to add in uh, some, some physical exercise. You may need to add in a good diet, add in a good night's sleep. You know, those things can go a long, long way toward relieving discouragement. And so if you've got a friend who's discouraged, you know, you may encourage them. Let's go for a walk. Let's ride bikes. Let's shoot some hoops. Let's do something active. Do something to build them up from a physical standpoint. You know, every activity that you're involved in is either draining 
or replenishing. Every relationship, every friendship that you have is either draining or replenishing. Uh, some of them are both draining and replenishing. And so you've got to pay attention to your activities, pay attention to your relationships, and make sure that you don't get the draining and the replenishing out of balance. If all your activities, if all your relationships are draining, you're going to face constant discouragement. Now, if all your activities, if all your relationships are replenishing, then your life is going to lack substance and meaning. Uh, frankly, you're going to turn into a selfish little clod. And so you need the balance. You know, that, that's why we encourage you around here to work one, worship one. Because you need to do both if you're going to be in balance. If you just come to the service every weekend and just soak it in, you're going to sit soak and sour. You need an opportunity to, to give out. You've got to do both. You've got to be balanced in your activities, balanced in your relationships. And so you may want to ask yourself, well, what kind of friend am I? Am I draining or replenishing? Am I always taking from my friends or am I pouring into them? And you know, what kind of friends do I have? Are, are they draining or replenishing? Are they always taken from me? Or do I have friends who are pouring into me? Because you've got to strike a healthy balance between giving out and taking in. And if you're discouraged, it probably means that that's out of balance in your life. You're worn out. You're fatigued. Second warning sign is fear. That's where you're consumed by worry. And Moses says, where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? And if you've got teenagers in the house, that, that's probably a good memory verse for you, you know. I mean, you can understand that. But if you look at Moses' life, you'll, you'll see that Moses often worried about things that weren't his responsibility. You know, Moses would take on responsibilities that God never intended for him to have. He often tried to play God. And God, God wanted Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. But he didn't say that Moses had to provide for them. You know, that was God's job. But Moses worried about it. And so you may want to look at your life. You know, what are you worrying about that's really God's responsibility? And I'm not, I'm not saying that you should go through life and never worry. I mean, there are some things that you ought to be concerned about, things you need to be prepared for and planned for. But when you're discouraged, it can be because you're consumed by worry. And when you're consumed by worry, it gives birth to fear, and, and you can become afraid of life. You know, worry is like a dirty sponge that wipes away your joy and leaves a residue of fear. Isn't that, isn't that a gross picture? I love that. It's, it's like a dirty sponge that wipes away your joy and just leaves a, a dirty film uh, of fear. That can push you into discouragement. Third warning sign is frustration. And that's where you're consumed by unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. Moses said to God, why are you treating me so miserably? What did I do to deserve this? You know, those are unmet expectations. He expected God to treat him in a certain way and that treatment wasn't forthcoming. You know, Moses had given up his life in Egypt. He'd given up a position of power and authority. He'd sacrificed everything to lead these people. He's thinking, you know, I confronted Pharaoh, uh, you know, severed my family relationships with the house of Pharaoh in Egypt, uh, went through the 10 plagues. I got these people through the Red Sea. I got them out of slavery. I'm leading them to the promised land. I mean, you would expect these people not to complain so much. You would expect these people to be more thankful, more, more compliant, but Moses had no such luck. Unmet expectations lead to frustration. And maybe you've got some unmet expectations. Maybe your job's not working out the way that you had hoped. Maybe your marriage isn't all that you thought it was going to be. You know, you, you, maybe your friendships aren't just as deep and as fulfilling as, as you thought they would be. 
And so, you know, your dreams just, just aren't, ha you have unmet expectations. And what happens in that situation is you, you can wind up focusing on the person that let you down. Or you can wind up focusing on the situation that's not all that you want it to be. And the truth is, people are going to let you down. Because we're all sinners, we all fall short. And so if you're, if you're putting your expectations on people, they're going to be unmet. And the truth is, our dreams aren't going to be fulfilled here. Our dreams are going to be fulfilled in heaven. But this is a broken world where we're often disappointed in what happens in life. And when I begin to focus on those people who've let me down or I focus on those situations that aren't what I hoped they would be, then suddenly those unmet expectations are just right here. They, they just, they block our vision. They keep us from seeing the bigger picture. They just loom large and I lose my perspective. And oftentimes that's what discouragement is, is you're just living with your unmet expectations right here. And because of that, you can't see what's out there. You can't see what's bigger. So fear or fatigue, fear, frustration, any one of those can move in and cause you to be discouraged. And you may see those warning signs in yourself. You may see them in a friend. But no matter what the cause of discouragement is, Jesus Christ offers us a way to break out of that discouragement. And you need the hope that Jesus Christ offers. And so you've got a friend who's battling discouragement. You need to point them to the hope of Christ. Here's the hope that you can point them to. Number one, on your notes, Jesus offers us power we don't have. When I'm fatigued, when I'm tired, when I'm worn out, when I'm consumed by weariness, Jesus offers me a power that I don't have in myself. Uh, you ever watch the, the World's Strongest Man competition? Uh, they've been doing this every year for years, and, and I love watching them. I thought about entering. Uh, but, you know, I mean, these, these guys, I mean, they'll hook these guys up to a jet airliner, and they'll, and they'll pull the thing, or they'll hook them up to a semi, and, and they pull the thing. I mean, if, if I'm ever in that position, it's because the truck is running over me, <laughs> not because I'm pulling it. You know, these guys, will ju they'll juggle live elephants. I mean, it's just amazing what, yeah. Uh, but as impressive as that physical power, that physical strength is, you know, when you have issues and problems and situations in life that you can't handle, it doesn't matter how physically strong you are. Uh, you need a power greater than your own. Uh, you know, and God's answer to your personal energy crisis is his power. You, you get his power when he fills you with his presence. Look at Romans 15. It says, may the God of hope fill you, circle those two words, fill you with all joy and peace. That's the opposite of discouragement. As you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God promises to fill you to overflowing through the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, there, there are a lot of a lot of people who would say, you know, I, I've confessed my sin. I've asked Jesus Christ to forgive me. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. But I don't feel his power. You know, a lot of people, a lot of believers live powerless lives. Why? Because there's a key word in this verse. And that word is trust. Fill you as you trust in him. Let me give you another word for trust. It's the word depend on him. Anybody have spring allergies? Okay, yeah, about half of, half of you. That's the way it is in my house. About half of us have spring allergies. You know, the trees bloom and the buds look pretty and half the family is sneezing and miserable, okay? And, uh, and, and when that happens, we get out the Claritin, we get out the Aliver, we get out the Allermac. And, but, you know, those little pills only work if you depend on them. You know, if you leave them on the kitchen counter, uh, nothing happens. You put them on the nightstand, nothing happens. If you keep them in your pocket, nothing happens. I mean, if you read the instructions on the box, nothing happens. You can carry the box around with you all day, nothing happens. I've got to depend 
on it. I've got to use it. Same is true with God's power. And when you say yes to God, his power is totally available to you. The problem is most of us do not depend on it. We don't use it. We try to live life in our own strength, in our own power. We say, yeah, I want God to save me so I can go to heaven when I die, but uh, truthfully, I don't want to access his power by depending on him here because if I depend on God, then I'm going to have to do what God wants me to do and rather than doing what I want to do. You know, I, if I'm using my own strength, I can do whatever I want to do. I don't have to do what God wants me to do. But if I'm going to beat discouragement, I, I need Christ's power in my life. Colossians 1.29, I depend, there it is, I depend on Christ's mighty power that works within me. And a lot of people say, well, yeah, I want God's power in my life, but I want God's power to live the way I want to live. Well, why would God give you his power to pursue your purpose instead of God's purpose? You know, I want God's power to accomplish my hopes and dreams. Well, well, think about that. Why would God give you his supernatural power to go your own way? Why would God power you up to be disobedient? It just doesn't make sense. But God does offer you his power to fulfill his purpose for your life. Philippians 4.13 I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. And so there's hope, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of the conditions that you find yourself in. Jesus Christ offers us a power that we don't have. You need to remember that. Second hope that we can point a discouraged friend to. Jesus offers us promises we can depend on. You know, when I'm afraid, when I'm living in fear, when I'm worrying too much, the only way out of that is by depending on God's promises. And there are over 7,000 promises in Scripture, over 7,000 promises that God makes in Scripture. And depending on those promises is what gets us through. Now look at this, Isaiah, Isaiah 41, it's just a, just a stack of God's promises. Do not fear, for I am with you. That's a promise. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. That's a promise. I will strengthen you, a promise, and help you, a promise. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand, a promise. And you need to hang on to that promise. Because every day you trust in something, every day you trust in someone. Why not trust in someone who will never let you down? Someone whose love will never fade, will never disappoint. Jesus offers us, he offers us power we don't have, and he offers us promises that we can depend on. That's something you can point a friend to. Third hope. Jesus offers us the perspective of his purpose. You know, when I'm frustrated, it's because I'm focusing on the small picture. I'm focusing on those unmet expectations. But God gives me a bigger perspective. Jesus offers me the perspective of his purpose. And, and God's purpose for my life is greater than any problem that I've got. You know, when, we, when we've lost perspective, God, God said, you know, you're focusing on the wrong things. You're focusing on the little things. You're discouraged by that person who let you down. You're down because of your job situation. You know, you're looking at the small picture. God says, I, I got a bigger perspective. And in the midst of discouragement, God says, I love you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I want to use you. I want to fill you. I want to give you my power. I, I promise that I've got a good purpose for your life. And so whatever the circumstance that you or a friend are going through right now, God has a bigger plan. And his bigger plan will not disappoint. Romans 5 says this expectation will not disappoint. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. No matter what you're feeling, there's a bigger perspective. There's a bigger picture. I promise for you in Romans 8.28, we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. And so when you're discouraged and you're focused on the small picture, look up. Look up. 
You got a friend who's discouraged, encourage them. Look up because God has a bigger perspective. And that perspective is filled with hope. It's filled with hope. You know something about hope? Hope is, hope is really attractive. It's really attractive. Hope draws people to Jesus Christ. And when we show the hope of Christ in our lives, it's attractive to other people. You know, Jesus wants your life to be filled with hope, overflowing with hope, especially when life is tough. Because that's what draws people to, to Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, my purpose is to give life in all its fullness. That's, that's the purpose that Jesus Christ came to fulfill, to give life in all its fullness. You know, we live in uncertain times. And I don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. I don't know what the, the, the future holds. I don't know about the economy. I mean, it's up, it's down, it's stimulated, it's discouraged. Job security, I mean, you know, one day you got a job, the next day you don't. Health, <laughs> you know, one day you feel good, the next day you don't. But I can tell you that no one can offer you what Jesus Christ can offer you. And he offers you a life filled with his power instead of fatigue. He offers you a life filled with his promises instead of fear. And he offers you a life filled with his purpose instead of frustration. And as you receive God's power, God's promises, God's perspective, he wants you to pass it on to other people. Let's pray together. God, it's just a treat to be alive another day so we can praise you. And I thank you that that you use us in the midst of our discouragement. You you love us even even though we're looking at the small picture. God, thank you that we don't have to walk out of here today the same as we walked in. And so I thank you for the promise of your power, and I pray that each of us would depend upon it, that we would claim it, that we would use it. Thank you for your promises in the Bible that we can hang on to those in the battle over worry and fear. And God, thank you for your bigger perspective. Thank you that that we have a hope that's greater than any problem we may face. And for those of us with our heads buried in the small picture, focused on the people who've let us down or the difficult circumstances or even the tragedies that have come into our life, God, I pray that we would look up, that we would look up and see the hope that you offer us today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.